It is with great pleasure that I introduce our last keynote speaker for today, Greg, uh, who's going to be fast, frugal, and focused. That's great. Please. Greg. Thanks, and thanks for having me. Um, so Aristotle declared that mankind is rational, and Bertrand Russell confessed to spending a lifetime searching in vain for evidence to count in Aristotle's favor. So if you look, uh, the laws of logic, the axioms of probability, the precepts of utility theory, humans flout them all. And we do so as a matter of course. So some look at this evidence and uh, see that what we've learned, say, in the last century is just the ways in which we err. And that Russell was largely right and we're poor, irrational creatures. Uh, this is a character of Daniel Kahneman's view of the state of affairs, that Russell was right, Aristotle was wrong. Others look at the same psychological record, and they say, well, not so fast. It looks to us that there's a misunderstood faculty, rather than rank irrationality, that what people do is they use these simple rules of thumb called heuristics, and yes, these things don't work at all the way that logic, or appear not to work at all, the way that logic and decision theory does, but uh, that just points to us appealing to a notion of rationality that's more attuned to the gods than to man, right? And this has been the debate uh, between Giga Rinzer and the fast and frugal school, who are more sympathetic to this notion of heuristics and think that it ought to be studied uh, mathematically. And uh, those who are a little more pessimistic to think pretty much the parameters of rational choice are fixed and uh, we just have to live with how far short we, we live up to these uh, standards. Um, but the, nobody thinks that heuristics are always better than uh, utility maximization. The task is to explain when and under what conditions heuristics do perform better out of sampling uh, choice problems. Uh, out of sample prediction is one area that's uh, pointed to is one where heuristics perform rather well. Um, and, to, and to specify when they don't, right? So, I mean, the goal is, this is a lot of a long stage setting, but the goal is to try to understand in the heuristic school's own terms what the, what the structure is of these rules, the conditions under which they perform well, so that we can be in a position to start to compare them as just one decision model among many. And what are the conditions under which they perform well? What are the conditions in which they don't? And I think the first step for that is to try to articulate um, um, how th uh, a particular class I'm going to be talking about today, uh, these rules work on the terms that the fast and frugal school in, uh, embraces. So that later on down the line, we can look about how to reduce this to more familiar models, but first things first. That's the approach I'm taking. So uh, to... Well, following that line, I mean, how to approach this problem, uh, this, uh, the fast and frugal school is very much in the school of Simon, uh, Herbert Simon's bounded rationality. This is a very old picture of Simon. I believe this thing around his neck is a microphone. Uh, but uh, there's two ideas, basically, that drive bounded rationality. One is, well, Simon's question is the species of what I just said, is that how is it that human beings um, reason when the conditions for rationally postulated by our models aren't satisfied, right? So there are two components to this. One uh, focuses on the limitations of the human mind. And when we think of bounded rationality, this is probably what springs to most people's minds. We're limited agents. We have limited time, we have limited cognitive abilities. Uh, so for postulating uh, integration or juggling many, many variables, this might not be a reasonable, and this is an invariant limitation of, of, across creatures of our kind. If our rational, principles of rationality are calling upon these operations, they might not be uh, good day-to-day -day norms. <clears throat> I think you'll have these slides. You can read these quotes if you like later. But the other component that's often not uh, emphasized, but it was part of Simon's original paper when he proposed his bounded rationality, and even Simon himself didn't talk as much about the second component, was an ecological component. So in the first part of bounded rationality, limitations on the, on the uh, uh, decision makers' cognitive abilities, computational abilities. The second part is to uh, 
Think about the role that the environment plays, the structural role, the relationship between the agent and the environment. And the example that Simon gave in his paper originally was food foraging behavior, right? So particular strategies to be rational for a creature in which food is distributed, say, randomly wouldn't fare so well, all things considered, if the distribution of food were, uh, say, multimodal. Yes? Necessarily. So I'll read this one. Now, if an organism is confronted with the problem of behaving approximately rational, or adaptively in a particular environment, the kinds of simplifications uh, to its choice, uh, the kinds of simplifications to its choice mechanisms that are suitable may depend not only on the characteristics, sensory that we talked about before, right, the neural um, sensory and uh, other characteristics of the organism, but may equally uh, depend upon the structure of the environment. Hence, we, may, we might hope to discover by a careful examination of some of the fundamental structural characteristics of the environment some <laughs> further clues as to the nature of the approximating mechanisms used in decision making. Just as a foreshadowing, I'm interested in this ecological problem. This is usually the weak point of the, uh, of the models for fast and frugal heuristics. What's the relationship between these rules and the characteristics in the environment? So you often hear the, so the, the slogan that captures both of these ideas for bounded rationality, at least in Simon's original conception, is that there is a psychological component, the cognitive limitations, and there's this ecological component, environmental constraints, and there's an oft quoted uh, thing from uh, a late article of Simon of talking about these things working together as blades of a scissors that irrational behavior should be understood as the interaction of these two components. Something like a scissors. The question is, how do they interact? Okay, let's, let's start with an, an example that I'll use as a running example of the kind of decision tasks that I want to uh, explore. And so now we're in the second part of stage setting. All right. Uh, so it's the first force choice paired comparison task. So you can imagine there's an agent that must decide uh, which of two objects, A and B. These could be countries, say, um, Albania and Bolivia. Has the larger value in some numerical criterion, C, let's say GDP, gross domestic product, based on their values, that each of the objects' values, on a set of, uh, in this case, we'll assume binary cues. This stuff can be generalized, but this is going to, the theme of this is going to be stripped down, uh, making things as simple as possible. So there's little technicalities later that I'm alighting over. Let's just treat them as binary cues, uh, x1 through xn, right? So the agent is presumed not to know which has the higher GDP, let's say in our example, but uh, will look to a set of available cues to try to make that judgment, right? <coughs> Now, heuristics, there are a bunch of these things. There's not just one of them. We'll be looking at one particular one. I want to compare uh, two of them that are very common, just so you get a feel for these things. They are actually um, specified rules, at least in the fast and frugal school, not just intuitive things that people do. So these two that I'll compare, one is uh, take the best, and the other is uh, Robin Dahl's is, uh, tallying. So the way this works for each of these, each of them has a search rule. So a take the best is, is the class we'll be focusing on. The, how this thing works is agents look uh, for one good reason to discriminate between, like in our tasks. So the first cue that the agent finds, and they're supposed to be ranked ordered in their um, accuracy in predicting uh, which is higher on the criterion. The first one that actually discriminates between the objects, we pick that and then stop. So the search rules look up the queue with the highest validity for search uh, for the take the best. And in comparison, tallying is just as it suggests. You have all your cues, you put your, uh, you write them down, say, and you add them up. How many in favor, how many opposed, and the one with the higher value gets the, uh, gets the nod, yes? So you look up all, the, you can look them up in random order in tallying. Uh, stopping rule, uh, I already mentioned it for take the best, you, the Q, if the highest uh, validity does not uh, discriminate, you go to the next one. First one discriminates, you stop your search. Whereas uh, stopping rule for tallying is you look at all of them or some subset of them if you have uh, uh, some additional criteria. And then the decision rules, well, and take the best, you predict that the alternative with the positive Q value is the highest criterion. So the first one discriminates, you take it. 
and decision rules, you predict the higher number of positive cues, you tally them. Now, each of these, of course, has biases, right? The first ignores information, uh, and the other is ignoring weights, right? So this ec one way to start to get into this ecological question that uh, you might think, okay, well, uh, what, are ki what are environmental conditions under which ignoring information is uh, helpful? Yes. There's a first approximation of the, of the, of the puzzle I'm interested in. Okay, so uh, just to mention that this isn't a toy example, this is grounded in uh, what people do. Uh, there are various studies. There's one uh, aggregate study that, that suggests that this, this thing on the left, this take the best, this, it's a non-compensatory non lexicographic rule. Uh, and in that family, that's the one in this paper was the major mode. Let's just say it's a major mode of what people do. Right, so going back to our original introduction, uh, if we can't make any progress to explaining under what conditions these things rule, it would seem that Russell and Kahneman are right. I mean, we're just we're irrational. Because uh, this is what we do often. And certainly there are cases in which we shouldn't do it, but are there any cases in which it makes sense to do it is my question. So anyway, these are some, lit some of the literature review of uh, folks finding that, yes, indeed, this is rules of this kind, this one good reason is what people do. So this question of whether they should or not, uh, this is character of some, somewhat, but um, ideally, if you're in the biases and heuristics tradition, this isn't something we should do. It's just things we do to get by because we can't integrate, we can't optimize. Uh, it's an imperfect approximation, and it's characteristic of what's sometimes called system one thinking, this intuitive thinking that if we had more time on our hands, we would know better and think deliberately, and we would invariably get better results. And it's prone to error. That's a caricature, but it's not too far off. Uh, and the fast and frugal school, uh, ideally, this is, uh, these are things that can be... Uh, can be good or even better than utility maximization, uh, usually when the conditions that are assumed uh, for standard models just aren't met. Uh, can be performed intuitively or deliberatively. And this is what, why it starts to become interesting for a logician or a decision theorist. Uh, so this is a difference between the schools. Uh, and as I mentioned before in my setup is that there, the, the thinking is one of the constituent reasons for when these things work, are the adaptive, uh, the, the rules are adapted to the structure of the decision-making environment. So it's, so we're narrowing down to what I'm interested in talking about today. And it's, one, this idea that these are a class of rules that can be performed deliberately. And I gave you sort of a sketch of what these decision, two of them anyway, would, would work. You could code them up and study them as decision models. And this idea of uh, how to account for the uh, structure, the ecological uh, behavior. Okay, so this question, this adaptiveness question, just a little bit more history, then we'll jump in, um, is a Brunswickian question. So this is Egan Brunswick, and he pioneered the study, the use of correlation statistics to explain the um, informativeness of proximal cues that an organism has to the distal or objective cues in the environment. So you can think of an organism, and this is light hitting the retina, and uh, that's the cue that's available to the organism, and the relationship between those cues or that cue and, let's say, things in the environment that the organism be interested in, such as food, uh, pre prey, predator, or uh, uh, shelter, yes? So what uh, Brunswick was looking at was uh, how relationships between cues and distal objects, uh, what, how you can extract information from this that would be useful for the decision maker. So uh, my question is, under what environmental conditions do these single, this class of single reason rules perform well? Okay. And this has been something that's in the literature, the max Psych literature, and the answers I want to suggest have been uh, disturbing for the fast and frugal school. So, one, uh, these are uh, uh, answers that have been offered. Uh, 
And the results have come from a mixture of analytical results and simulation results. So it's a, it's a hodgepodge of methods. And it gives this kind of, it's this old Jane's tale of the blind men around the elephant, you know, feeling up. And it's the, the rules are like a trunk, the rules are like the rope, and they're feeling different parts of the elephant. We're getting this sort of incomplete story. So, uh, so for instance, one of them says the cues, we're looking at ideal conditions under which these rules, these single reason rules models work. Cues, they should be highly intercorrelated. That's a good condition. Uh, it's Hogarth and Carlyle. Another one says, also Hogarth's on this, it's, it actually is entailed by the lens model, so it's not an explicit, it just falls out from, cues are independent, that's a good condition. Well, another is cues are conditionally independent, and I might mention if cues are independent, they're conditionally dependent. If cues are conditionally independent, they're, uh, if they're conditionally dependent. And then there's this other one that's more, a little more recent. The single predictor cue uh, is highly correlated with the other cues, but the remaining cues are uncorrelated with one another. That one came out of simulation. You can just sort of feel that one, yeah? So we, I mean, this is, uh, this looks, okay, so now you're in my position. You're looking at this like, somebody's got to be wrong. They just, got, you know, Arr. they're all right. That's what I want to show, and I want to show you how this, and I was surprised. Or it, the evidence that we have, analytical results I want to show you, is that all of these are reasonable. So that's the story, that's the talk. I want to explain to you why all these things are actually true. They're, yes? So that's a good question. They also vary on this. What I, I'll be showing you a model that makes that uh, make the performance clear. So I'm going to be reducing the problem to just comparisons of uh, what influences the conditional probability of a single cue and fixing everything else. Fix. So I'll be addressing that very question. But in this literature, it's, that is also something that is not clear and, and, and stable. So getting, actually getting this part clear was a little bit of work of what's going on. But come back to that if, if this question still remains open in the questions, because it is, uh, it, it is a, it's an issue. <clears throat> okay, so that's my Brunswickian question. So that's the setup. So now, uh, where, do I, where do I get the tool from? So keep that in mind. Now, uh, I have something from philosophy that turns out to be very important and, 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 uh, and useful for this. And this is a puzzle about epistemic coherence. So what's this idea? It builds on this intuitive idea where I say, well, if I have pieces of information in the environment, uh, I say cues, keep our terms straight, and each of them are relevant to my hypothesis, to my criterion that I'm interested in judging, I get an extra boost in some circumstances when these things fit together, when they're coherent in this everyday sense, not in the De Finetti sense, not in the logical sense, but they, they all hang together in some nice way. So if I start talking to you about a cowboy who, uh, you, the cues you have for this, whether or not this person's a cowboy, he drinks Bardot and he sings karaoke, you think, this isn't very coherent, this is unusual, this sounds like the beginning of a magazine piece, some eccentric. Whereas if I say, uh, whether the choice is a cowboy or a salaryman, a salaryman sings karaoke and drinks sake, you would think, well, that's coherent, given our background knowledge of just how Cult, basic cultural background knowledge of how these things fit together. So there's been a literature trying to explain this intuitive idea of evidence or cues fitting together and boosting posterior probability, giving some kind of probabilistic model for this. You think this should be easy. Probability models are very flexible. Uh, and the, the question posed a little bit more precisely is, is there some measure of coherence, some measure, probabilistic measure of how cues fit together. This is a Brunswickian question, by the way. How cues are related to one another, not just cues to the decision uh, variable. And measures of confirmation, boost in posterior probability. So there's some pair of these things on which more coherence entails higher confirmation. That was the question that exercised formal philosophers in the 90s, and it hit a brick wall about 10 years ago, uh, in large part with a uh, colleague of, of Richard's. Uh, and uh, the answer is, it depends on who you ask, uh, 
uh, a categorical no, if you ask Eric Olson, that there's, this is impossible. Uh, and a qualified no, if you ask uh, Luke Bovenson and Stefan Hartman. And this put an end to this, you know, <laughs> It's put really a screeching stop to this literature. There's some things that trickled out, but uh, it's really sort of ended. And I got interested in this question. And uh, it turns out that mathematically they're right. There's they're the models that they're looking at. Uh, you get this problem. But the models they're looking at wasn't characteristic. So here's the linchpin to the talk. Kind of cool. Is that in these models, they're terrible for this coherence question. But they're one of a handful of models that are actually good and beneficial for this single Q reasoning that I'm going to be talking about. So that's how the two parts of the talk fit together. So there's also a little bit of a hint about how to stitch together some things in epistemology with the stuff that we're working on. OK, so I'm stage setting. I'm putting a lot of chits down for promises I have to get to try to, try to uh, live up to this billing is. Yes. Anyway, so this was seen to be a problem. And um, so I, I want to just go through quickly about how we, the, the model of what we have to, to resolve this puzzle. So actually, there's a whole complaints about what's the right coherence measure, what's the right confirmation. I don't care about that. I'm going to talk about measures of coherence as a class, incremental confirmation. And what I mean by that is this on this list. So you've probably seen variations of this. Uh, first ones, you're looking at the, the boost, the incremental. Uh, benefit of E2, seeing E2 after you've already seen E1. These are, think of these as binary, uh, think of these as propositions, these are events on some hypothesis. Uh, second one is uh, normalized by how much, is, how much is left over after you've seen E1. And likewise, there are log versions of this. There's something that looks at likelihoods. Basically, when I say incremental confirmation, I mean anything on this list are ordinarily equivalent to what's on this list. The differences between them, I don't care. Uh, this is, Okay, there's some things that aren't old evidence. Uh, there's a weak Carnapian measure that uh, breaks some of the results. They're just they're too weak. They don't have enough traction. So it's it's not everything, but what's generally understood as incremental confirmation, that's what I mean. And combination of these things, I think Krupy has a Z measure that com combines these things under different conditions, but that that doesn't matter either. Okay, measures of coherence. Well, the uh, there's very simple ideas about basically. Nobody's actually looked at Pearson's co correlation coefficient in this literature. I don't know why, but they haven't. Um, what I'm going to be looking at is just basically the components of covariation. I mean, very, very simple. Just very, because I'm looking for a very general model, right? So I'm just looking at covariation, which Shogenji, but this goes back to Yule. You can see Yule's textbook from the turn of the 20th century. He's talking about measures of this kind. Uh, it's the very beginning of statistics. Uh, so this is distance from independence. So clearly, if this thing is 1, this is the case when x and y are independent. If this ratio is greater than 1, then there's a positive correlation between them. If it's between 0 and 1, it's negatively correlated. Yeah. So uh, this basic divergence from independence, that's what I'm going to mean by coherence. And I should say this Shugenji, this measure is one of the first things that popped up in the coherence literature. So this isn't news either, it was investigated, um, but with a couple of twists that I think put them down a blind alley. Okay, and there's other measures in the literature that are uh, variations usually of, of Shogenzi, or actually a lot of people have looked at confirmation measures and re-engineered them, re-engineered coherence measures from that, but that, that's a whole other talk and discussion. Okay, so the measure that I'm looking at, it's the, actually it's the quantity, So because this measure is not very sophisticated by design. It's this idea of looking at this ratio, uh, which I called focus correlation. Mirvold looked at it in, in terms of trying to unify, unify um, coherence measures. He was looking at it in this form. If you pull it out this way, I mean, algebraically it's a little messy, but conceptually I think it's very easy. So what you're looking at is you're looking at how, how much is this evidence, the cues, how much are they associated on their own? versus how much association you see in the evidence given some hypothesis, right? Example, you go home today. Uh, you uh, walk into your apartment. Uh, if, I think there's still enough devices for this example is an inaccurate, but you know, microwave clocks flashing two, uh, 11, uh, 1130. 
your uh, another uh, bedroom clock flashing 11:30. Another electric device, maybe your stove flashing 11:30. You think, ah, oh, this is unusual. On its own, each of these things flashing at the same time, I wouldn't expect that. It's very It's not associated. However, given the hypothesis that there's a power cut, uh, these things make sense, right? Given an, given this explanation that, that and, you, and then this ratio would be what we would call inflationary. And what it turns out with some mild conditions, when that condition holds, then the, hypo the evidence confirms the hypothesis. You get a boost. That's the idea. <coughs> so the answer, is there uh, a measure of coherence, measure of confirmation pair in which more coherence entails higher confirmation? Yeah, there's tons of them built on this, this idea I just told you. Uh, for the class of incremental confirmation measures and focus correlation, I just mentioned inflationary co correlation entails positive incremental confirmation along the whole route. And I'll talk about the boundary condition, the, the weak conditions that make this go through. But it more so, you can compare, you can compare evidence sets or compare their informativeness. Um, so more focus correlation uh, holds if and only if there's more incremental confirmation. And that was, the main, that was the main question that was exercised in this coherence literature. When can you say that one evidence set's more coherent than the other? When does that give you more of an uh, epistemic advantage than the other? Um, I have slides in the back end that explains the impossibility results if people are interested in that. I probably will skip, skip over that. Here are the boundary, I'll just explain in Probably Richard's interested in this. <laughs> so I'll explain just in passing how this, uh, these impossibility results, where they fit. So the boundary conditions for this, they're fairly weak. There's a causal component to this whole model. That's the C, missing C that I will be talking about. So it's causation, confirmation, and coherence or correlation. Uh, and I, I need this regularity condition here so I have no ones and zeros showing up because I'm going to be activating the theory of causal Bayes-Nets, and that screws everything up if you have that. Uh, Positive relevance, I'm just assuming that all of each of the cues are informative. So that's what I mean by positive evidence. That's the condition that gets you know, more focus correlation, more incremental confirmation, full stop. The comparison question, I had another condition, which is strong theoretically. That is, each of the pieces of evidence are the same. Now, theoretically, you want that because if you, you want to pinpoint that diff it's differences in, incremental com differences in incremental confirmation. The reason is differences in correlation. We can relax this. Okay? And we do. The witness, the impossibility results, basically it's this it's conditional independence assumption that screws everything up. And they don't, they have, there's other hair in the models. They don't have a regular, they sometimes have a regularity condition. So that's another thing that's disconnected because they're trying to incorporate a logical notion of coherence into this too. But set that aside. But that's what's going on. That's the, that's the moral. It's, it's a conditional independence assumption that's driving the impossibility results. And also is one of the class of models that's helpful for single rule reason, which we should get to. Okay. Um, to explain a little bit what's going on with, this, uh, with these models, um, this is some work I did with Max Schlosshauer. Um, yeah, let's do this. So you can think of like how, did, how this thing gets together. If, if I had the equal evidence condition, this term would be one. This is the first in the list of incremental confirmations. How much, you're in this situation where you have, you're interested in H, you've seen E1, and maybe you have a choice between, well, should I look for the set that gives me E2, or should I look for the set that gives me E3 instead? Which is more coherent? That is, which, in terms of coherence, which is, going to be a higher posterior probability. Well, uh, this term drops out if this is one. And then I'm just comparing focus correlation of each of these things. That's how it works out. And then you can see, you can put bounds on how, this, how, this, how these things can vary so it doesn't wash out the benefits in focus correlation. And that's essentially what Max and I did. So, <clears throat> so uh, I can skip those slides. This is just how to relax that equal evidence condition and that the tracking theorem I mentioned goes through. Okay, so that's hopefully you get a flavor for the tool, or one part of the tool we're using. It's a larger framework that has a causal component too, as I mentioned. So let's go back to our question with heuristics. Under what environmental conditions do single reason rules perform well? And you get all these different answers. It seemed to be not contradictory, but it would be really surprising because you're saying opposite things. It seems to say be trivial. 
trivializes the, the question. Well, assume I've switched notations, apologies for that. So this was our hypothesis before, and I think uh, evidence is or it's the uh, cues. So if I have one single reason, uh, basically I have a focus correlation term which is flipped upside down. So now I have, I'm looking at the amount of association in my evidence over the conditional association. This focus correlation upside down. Then I have this other term, which basically is the, the conditional probabilities, all the individual validities that are, are left over after looking, because I'm singling out uh, the highest Q. E1, and then this, this, this constant is basically under the assumption that my, my prior on my uh, criterion, I don't know, so it's one half. So you just flip this around, move this around a little bit, and what I want to do is give a behavioral explanation of each of these terms, and then answer the question before of why these seemingly contradictory environmental conditions turn out to be favorable for uh, this single Q, that is it's this comparison. To go back to your measurement question, if I'm comparing a, the single Q, the posterior of C on a single Q, versus the, the posterior of C, given all the information, I would expect this ratio to be great, greater than one. Yes? And the conditions laid out, uh, it's surprising how many of them, it turns out that that holds under these mild conditions. So let me explain each of these terms. And I should mention in the background, I always, we, ha, we this is my co-authors, have in mind we're looking for structures that can grasp on things that we know that people are able to do. Quantities that are, they're candidates, they're plausible candidates that people can grasp on. We need to test this still empirically, but that's, that's what's driving this, uh, our analysis. So if there are things that are on some sense a little too simple, on others that maybe are not very mathematically elegant, um, what's driving us is we're searching for things that we can uh, uh, test in the lab and see if there are things that people can, can grasp. And then later on we can look at how to make it prettier and what connections are hold with the existing models. Okay, so let's turn to each of these things. Yeah, so, um, you're expecting this ratio on the left-hand side to be greater than one in the cases where um, a single ring reason, single reason reasoning yes. is doing well. And, and, and it, it's, a, it's a necessary condition. It's a necessary condition. Yeah. For, just, so what I'm not, so I, it, it looks like that gives you a condition for a single reason as it were having big confirmatory impact on your hypothesis. What I'm not yet seeing is a sort of the connection to reality, as it were. Uh, uh, Good. Uh, it's going to come. I, it, it will come up in comments, yes. Okay. Let, me, let me lay the thing out and then address this, this issue. Cause, but good question. And if I don't, come back to me. Yes, OK. But it's, can, can you remind me what the XI is? Ah, pardon. This should be E. So these, these are E's and X's. I'm going between them. Uh, So uh, similar, putting slides from different talks. Apologies for that. Um, OK, so each of these terms I need to explain. So one is, you think of this as, again, psychologically. Uh, I'm interested in the posterior of C on XI or C on EI. The, the Q, first Q, what do I get for that from my criterion versus having to look through all of them? And well, one of the things, obviously, is what's the other cues, what are the other cues telling me? It's the product of each of these, uh, each of these, and then there's an extra term that I need to account for uh, the posterior on, or sorry, the prior on, on C, which is what shows up here. Now, one of the conditions we have for this is that each of the cues be positive evidence. So it's going to be greater than a half. Right? I mean, each of these things are relevant to my decision problem, otherwise I wouldn't have noticed them. So all these, each of these guys will be greater than 0.5. And it turns out it's kind of nice because this, under those conditions, just that condition, this term will be greater than one. And you can kind of plot, that's what this plot is. I put it in log scale, 
um, but this is basically just that term that's delta along this axis. And then what I'm plugging in is, it's a simplification, but each of the xi's, uh, this is, it's zero if it's, or, so if this is a half, this is one, so in log scale, uh, this would be zero. And then it's, a, it's just a monotone function. So I mean, I could, I could change the weights to each of these things, it would just change the slope of that line, but uh, it's positive, it's greater than one. Uh, and if it's uh, less than a half, it's negative. Okay, it takes care of that. Well, what about this other condition, right? This is getting at Hogarth's question, right? So Q's are associated, Q's are independent, <laughs> conditionally independent, conditionally dependent. So let's take that question. So this is the case of use graphical models just to capture this. So this is the one case where we say that the Q's uh, are um, conditionally independent given C, right? Well, under that condition, given the assumption that the Q's are positive in regularity, right? This will be one, right? under the independence condition. So this will be a quantity over one. Well, it turns out just on this positivity condition that the Q's will always be associated. So this term will be greater than one. So I have something greater than one times something greater than one. Well, that ratio will be greater than one. Nice. Well, what about this opposite condition where Q's here are independent, but they're conditionally dependent. So you could, in this condition, it's characteristic of uh, Q's being uh, direct causes of the criteria, if you give this a Bayesian, Bayesian net interpretation. Uh, well, that'll turn out then, in this case, that quantity is one. But it just, so a strange thing, if you look at, if you know things about Bayes nets, under, this, under the, if the individual, could, in, these individual links are all positive, which we're assuming, that under this condition, the association that's induced is negative. That is, this is deflationary. This will be less than one. So again, we have this quantity greater than one times greater than one is greater than one. And that's two of the issues. The, the little, the, 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 the one with, uh, where it's just a single Q and the others are screened off, you could just look, you, you, you can fumble in the algebra to see where that comes from as well. And it's, you know, an, analytical. It's not. And there's other cases, since we have all the quantities now, you can manipulate them and we can talk a little bit about what the elephant looks like at least with respect to this, uh, uh, this question of environmental uh, conditions. Um, okay, so I should mention in closing that the CCC model, this was work done with Richard Chinas, my colleague at CMU, and uh, Max Schlossauer. And uh, this connecting this stuff to heuristics is uh, with uh, Max Planck, uh, at uh, Konstantinos Katsikopoulos at Max Planck. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And I left Thanks. time to talk about the impossibility results if people are interested or something else. Thanks very much, Greg. That leaves us some time for discussion, so uh, please, Richard. Can I just ask my question again? Yes. <laughs> Where's reality in the story? So yeah, it's thank like, you. This, it looks like just a sort of inside the, inside the head of the fast confusal agent, they think they're doing well in right. these environments. Right. But who cares? Yeah. So the... Um, yeah, that's why, I, thanks for this, that's why I mentioned Brunswick and I didn't put a slide on this because it, it's a little hairy, right? I'm trying to make it clean. So, um, cleaner. So, uh, so Brunswick, I mentioned this, Egon Brunswick. This idea, of the, it's the lens model that is driving even the, the, the little model on the right of Barcells, uh, Carrasco, and Hog, Hogarth. And the idea is that the organism has these distal, uh, I don't need, need to label all of these, distal cues, and they're thought to be, um, correlations between the cues and also, you know, there's, there's the world here. So there's some variable and, uh, make it, uh, what am I, C's? some criterion, and then this is the world, right? This is supposed to be what's going on in the world. And then the, the, the 
decision maker of the organism has uh, its own variable and let's say uh, in the mind and will receive each of these but then there's also imagined to be uh, in the model judgments about what these correlations are right so that's that's the lens model uh, in sketch and it's due to Brunswick and it's still uh, it's 1943, I think. And it's still some, some mainstay in psychological research. So um, to get to your question, so how we're addressing the environmental questions, we're assuming that the, there's no loss. Well, I haven't talked at all about the loss function of what the agent's judgment is of what these correlations are. We're saying, since we're talking about the environment, is that suppose this is the structure. This is how those cues that the agents receive, uh, the judgments are just what the correlations are, how the things are arranged. So we're looking at this is the picture of the environment, and if the agent happens to have the judgment such that the cues are related to one another, the CW in this way, then we can expect that uh, caterus paribus, single cue reasoning would be better than multi cue reason. And then this is the reason I say it's necessary because there's the other things. I mean, I have to make judgments about this. I have to, are these the right cues? There's all these other issues that we're putting to the. Are there more questions? Oh, comments, maybe? Yeah. Question. So is. Um, when you instead uh, do not assume uh, that basically there is the objective model in the mind, uh, this is what I understood, that they're assuming that the objective model is in the mind of the agent, right? So it's uh, somehow, right? Or did I? Which, who, who is assuming? So you said, you know, that in your talk you are just looking at the left-hand side. That's right. Assuming that it is also what is in the mind uh, of, uh, so the, of the, the, the original model uh, assumes that there, part of the, the judgment is a loss function right. for each of these correlations that can vary. And that part I've just left to the so, side. So my, my question was whether in, in these models where there is also a right hand side uh, and the loss function, there is some kind of feedback. Yes. I, I so that, you know, a feedback from you know you know performance to survival uh, whatever some kind of dynamics yeah that. so okay so in this picture again it's simplified it's just decision modeling so I'm assuming on one case whatever learning the agent has it goes into the original judgment and whatever the loss I've left the loss functions out there are learning versions of this as well so you can look at learning problems through uh, a Brunswickian framework and yes I mean there's actually there's a student uh, now at CMU uh, uh, Sarah Wellen who's looking at precisely this question with respect to heuristics and her uh, proposal is to think of the learning problem what she wants to by learning and decision she wants to make them a model where decision making and learning are this distinction is uh, uh, well the model handles both of these cases that's the way to put it it's very it's very interesting work are there more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Greg again.